Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today we're speaking to an author, psychologist and educator who is passionate about helping you understand the mind and body connection. In a TED talk titled How to Make Stress Your Friend, she's amassed a staggering 25 million views. In her latest book, The Joy of Movement, she explores how just 20 minutes of physical activity can be a powerful antidote to the afflictions of depression, anxiety, and loneliness. The takeaways from our conversation include why physical activity during the pandemic is absolutely essential and how it's strongly linked to mental health, the importance of collective joy, distinguishing dependence from harmful addiction, and the vital role of hope molecules in improving our levels of resilience. So please welcome the mind and body visionary, Kelly McGonigal to the Escape Your Limits podcast. I have an innate fear of flying, as in I can't remember ever not being afraid to fly. I didn't fly for the first time until I was, I think, 20. And my first flight was absolutely catastrophic. Afterwards, the flight attendants were like, that was the worst flight they'd ever been on in 30 years of... Anyway, so I had a very traumatic first um, flight that then like embedded in my nervous system a severe fear of flying. And um, for many years, I didn't fly. And uh, I, ca- I had a very narrow life as a result of that in terms of family I could see and travel that I could do. And um, after a certain point, I decided that my life was too constrained and I was gonna to have to find a way to deal with it because I was no longer willing to choose the charade of comfort as if I was protecting myself from an experience I didn't want. That was creating more discomfort because I couldn't have the life that I wanted to have. And so I, I did a lot of things to overcome my fear of flying. I still don't like it, um, but I don't have to like be unconscious to to do it. And uh, you know, I been on the longest flight I think 14 hours and like before COVID I was flying at least several times a month. There are two things that allowed me to do that. One was a a deep sense that not flying was in contradiction to my values and my teaching. So I was a psychologist, I was teaching, I was helping people and there was this one thing in my life where I was really not practicing what I was preaching. I was I was like trying to just avoid the discomfort and the fear and, and not do something that mattered to me. And so I knew I had to fix it because how am I gonna help people if this huge part of my life is inconsistent with what I'm teaching? And so that was deeply motivating. And it's part of what keeps me flying, even though I still don't like it, which is that like literally the last time I was on a flight that was going through really bad turbulence, um, I got an email during the flight from somebody who had flown for the first time in years to be able to see their dying mother because they'd read in my book where I talked about overcoming my fear of flying and they talked about it with their therapist and blah, blah, blah. And so literally while I'm sitting on this plane thinking like, I don't want to be here, I get an email thanking me for writing about my fear of flying. And now this person was able to be with their mother because of that. That keeps me flying. But the other thing I did is um, I practiced flying by taking indoor cycling classes. I hated indoor cycling. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I, I felt exactly like I feel on a plane that's in the middle of, of super turbulence. And I couldn't practice it on a plane because I was too terrified. So I practiced being in an indoor cycling class, hating every minute of it uh, and staying on the bike and telling myself, this is like being on a plane and you can do this and you can get through this. And I ended up becoming certified as a cycling instructor because the experience was so meaningful that even though I thought I hated it, I fell in love with cycling because of the meaning that it held, which is brings us back to that idea. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, it's, uh, it's been very interesting 
researching uh, about your book, The Joy of Movement, and also to, to understand uh, a little bit more about you. And I, I know you call the book um, the book you were born to write. And um, I've kind of added that the book I wish I had written uh, because I, I think it's a fascinating subject and one I've been I've been quite passionate about for years. I, I was just mentioning a moment ago. I when I was younger in my early teens and going through all different stuff and work and girlfriends and things and and used to kind of go through these dark mental moments and it, and and I whenever I used to come back from the gym, the the, the world was just a different place. And um, I think after reading. Um, some of the, the studies that you've been done, it, it started to kind of make a little bit more sense uh, about what's going on. So, so thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love hearing that you wish you'd written the book because I feel that way about some books as well. Um, yeah, and I, I had a similar experience growing up. You know, I, I found that movement was one of the really reliable ways to deal with stress and anxiety, even as a little kid. Um, and it continues to be probably the greatest source of personal resilience in my life. Really? Yeah. So tell us a bit, just, just, well, just as, as a bit of a start, it would be good to, um, if you could just share a little bit of your background on, on what you, what you've studied and I guess how you came to this point where you, you know, you're an accomplished author and you're writing about psychology and fitness. Um, so if you, if you could share a little bit of a background for the audience, that'd be fantastic. Sure. So my training is I'm a health psychologist, a researcher, um, and I specialize in understanding the mind body relationship, things like, you know, how your emotions affect your cardiovascular health or your immune system, um, how it is that people can find social support during difficult health crises. I mean, anything that's really the intersection of um, trying to create well being and understand our lived experiences in the body. And um, like, so most people might know me from my TED talk, which was about how to make stress your friend, which I think is, is a really good sort of window into how I think about things. So the idea of that talk was that um, everyone experiences stress and we've all been told that stress is this toxic state that will inevitably kill your brain cells and give you a heart attack and destroy any chance you have of happiness. So the goal in life should be to avoid or reduce stress. And that talk was about actually how the science of stress reveals a much more complex portrait of stress that human beings have stress because it helps us survive and thrive. There are so many ways that the body and brain can respond to stress and many of them are healthy and helpful. Um, and that by learning more about that science, understanding ourselves better, understanding the mind-body connection better, we can actually use stress as a catalyst for things like courage and social connection and growth, that we aren't um, only sort of a victim to the circumstances in our lives that we, that we don't enjoy or sort of wish we weren't dealing with. And I think that that's pretty much how I sum up the way that I look at things. So I'm oriented to trying to figure out what are the things that people are dealing with that are really big pain points that are, you know, uh, w when people talk about what's challenging in their lives, what are they struggling with? And then I look to the science to see, okay, well, what, what do we know about how that works that we can intervene? What are our choice points? What are the strategies that can help us experience joy and meaning and hope? Um, even when things are difficult. And because I'm so interested in the mind-body connection, I'm often really interested in these you know, strategies that have a very clear biological impact. You know, I'm fascinated by things like that the, the way that you think about your anxiety could actually change how your heart and your blood vessels respond to a moment that makes you anxious. So I'm, I'm always interested in that sort of thing. Um, there's something about there's something about the mind-body connection that makes things feel so concrete and also empowering. I think it's it's fascinating that you can choose to do something or choose to think something that can have these the, these sort of upward spiral effects that um, can empower you or create health. And so movement is one of those. So you know, I the reason I said I was born to write this book is that um, you know movement is the thing that I've always turned to for for um stress relief and community and joy and uh and learning how to tolerate discomfort and find my own courage and so it was 
a, an absolute gift to be able to write this book because so much of the science in it is new, right? So you and I may have spent decades living it, but like there's, there's so much new science now that has that feeling of hope. The thing that I love about, you know, the mind body um, science is that now when you say, oh yeah, I feel better when I went to the gym and I can come in and be like, okay, let me explain some of the brain chemistry and like what we know about how to harness it so that if you choose to move your body today, you're gonna get an even bigger impact on your mood or your relationships with others. Mm. So you, I've, I've um, watched a, a video where you talked about stress and I, I guess you hear a lot about people saying, well, you want to avoid stress and stress raises your blood pressure and it leads to, you know, heart disease and all kinds of things. And and so I suppose it's it's seen as a bad thing. But I, I, I watched the, this video example where you talked about, you know, there are different types of stress. Some of them actually sort of, you know, reduce the you, you, the thickness of your arteries and some some of it sort of opens them up if I've got it correctly. So c can you yeah. sort of explain the, the differences between those two and why one is actually, you know, why certain stress is good for you? So the big idea uh, that I think is really important to understand is that there is more than one stress response. So the reason that stress has a bad reputation is we know that there are certain ways, there is at least one way that the body and brain can respond to stress that if your body and brain are in that state a lot, it's not healthy for you. And sometimes it's called the fight or flight response. So you might be feeling stressed or anxious or angry and you see changes in your cardiovascular system that include increased blood pressure, increased systemic inflammation, your blood vessels um, constrict, and uh, a lot of stuff going on that is, is not, it can be useful in the moment, like for responding to an emergency, um, but it's not a really healthy state to be in all the time. And so if that is your default response to stress and you're stressed all the time, it's one of the reasons why stress can be, um, can increase your risk of things like heart disease, depression, diabetes. It's, it's that, that link between a particular stress response, chronic stress, and these, these unwanted outcomes. But fight or flight's not the only way that your body and brain respond to stress. And we all have different stress uh, strengths, stress habits, and human beings have an incredibly vast stress repertoire. So uh, in contrast, the video that I think you watched, I describe a particular stress response called a challenge response, which is, it's not like it's the only other stress response, but it's one that's really similar to a fight or flight response in that it's really easy to shift from fight or flight into challenge. So they make a really good comparison. So a challenge response is a lot like actually what happens in your brain and body when you exercise. So physiologically, your heart is still going to uh, pound a little bit faster to give you energy, like in a fight or flight response. Um, but a challenge response is really, it's rooted in a belief that this is a moment that matters and you have the resources to respond to it. So fight or flight is really about feeling overwhelmed, feeling inadequate to the moment, um, feeling really threatened, not seeing an opportunity. It is a stress response that's really, it, it's just, it's rooted in either fear or uh, threat, defensiveness, in which your body's goal and your brain's goal becomes just defend yourself in this moment or to escape. But the challenge response is like, it's a moment that's stressful, but you're thinking, okay, I know how to handle this. I've been here before. I have some inner strengths that I can harness. Uh, I got some, maybe some support from around me that will help me through this. And the body and brain then shift into a different, um, different focus. Now it's all about giving you the energy and helping you access your resources so that you can rise to the challenge. And so you don't see the same things like, like widespread inflammation throughout your body. You see a different ratio of stress hormones. So you still have cortisol, which helps you use energy that gets dumped into your bloodstream. But you also see higher levels of things like DHEA, which is, uh, which is a stress as a stress hormone it actually helps your body um, sort of recover from stress. It's like, it's like, a, like a resilience hormone, but also it's a neurosteroid that helps your brain get strengthened by stress, which is a whole other thing we can talk about. But it's amazing that this, this is part of a stress response, that you are releasing chemicals and hormones that actually help your brain become more resilient as a result of going through stress uh, in the same way that 
know, like when you exercise your muscles, your muscles are changed, you know, blood vessels to your muscles, the actual structure of your muscles, they're transformed by that stress into something stronger, something that knows how to handle that physical challenge. Same thing happens to your brain when you have a challenge response to stress. Um, so those are some of the differences. And we know that a challenge response is healthy for your brain, it's healthy for your heart, it's healthy for your immune system. And uh, one of the reasons why I love to talk about the the two together, fight or flight and challenge, is that we know there, there are some pretty simple ways, if you're having a fight or flight response, to turn it into a challenge response. And one is to literally just talk to yourself by saying something like, I've got this. Or I could say to myself, Kelly, you've got this. There are literally studies showing that something as simple as that kind of self-talk um, can immediately begin to transform your stress response into a challenge response. You can um, tell yourself that stress is energy that you can harness. You can think about the people in your life who support you. You can remember times in your past when you've gone through something difficult and learned from it. So there are a lot of these, these sort of mindsets that you can take that help you have a stress response that is uh, actually healthy and helpful. Hmm. So it's interesting because I guess certain modern day stress is something that I guess is a new thing, you know, and I know, and you talk about evolution and how that stress de developed in, in us, but what it, it seems like it's that there's a very fine line between kind of uh, fight or flight stress and then this challenge stress. So if, if, if we kind of go back, uh, and I don't know whether you've looked at this, but if we go back in evolution, what were those two kind of connected in terms of one would sort of you know, get your attention and then, then you would evolve, progress into the other one. Was there a connection? And is that something that we probably maybe disconnected in, in, in more recent years, would you say? Yeah, so that's interesting. I don't know that we can fully answer that question. One thing that we, we probably can say is that when you look at other species, like every species has a fight or flight response. And I think it's one of the reasons why it's often our default response that um, sort of all species have the goal to survive and avoid threat. And so it is built deeply into the structure of every nervous system, like in a creature that is alive. And that's true for human beings as well. Now there are these other stress responses, some of them you will see in other social species, um, social species like other primates, non-human primates, and uh, even like, like rats and rodents can be very social. Um, prairie dogs. Anyway, so you can see in other species some of these stress responses. They often see, they also seem to exist. Um, for example, attend and befriend stress response, which is what happens when a stressful circumstance triggers the um, desire to connect with others, to um, find social support, to not be alone. And in non-humans, that can look like literally like huddling up. You'll see so many social species when they're feeling threatened or stressed and they can't handle it on their own. They'll, they'll literally like form a pack in or, or they'll, they'll support one another. I mean, you will see like rats rescue other rats anyways. So we know that we have the capacity to reach out, to ask for help, to help others, to join forces, to be stronger together. And that's a, also a stress response. Um, in humans, it's much more developed than that. And we also like to talk about our problems and we also will get like resilience, uh, a particular kind of resilience that comes from helping others, that comes from the meaning that we make out of, you know, being able to do something uh, of value to people we care about. And then there is, um, you know, there, there are other types of stress instincts that seem to be really new and modern in the sense that probably humans are the only creatures that have it, um, such as the meaning making instinct. So I don't know for sure, but I don't think that my cat has an instinct to deeply emotionally process traumatic experiences in order to create an inner narrative that helps her move forward in life, but humans have that instinct. And again, like it's fascinating that that is biologically based, it is innate, and it's part of how humans survive. That part of your stress response, which we sometimes experience as symptoms we don't like, like insomnia and intrusive memories and playing out um, sort of alternate realities to try to figure out how we could have avoided something stressful. Things that are, can be really unpleasant when we're in the middle of it, um, are actually a biological instinct to try to help you learn from experience and to craft a narrative about that experience and about yourself that helps you move forward, not only to prevent future suffering, but also to create a, sort of an understanding of who you are and your place in the world. 
and uh, and that's an, that's another place where psychology can actually be a, obviously of great support in helping us mm. figure out what those stories are that we want to mm. tell about ourselves. So connecting it into fitness and and staying on stress for a moment, I I, I believe there was um, I, I believe you you know there's an area where you talk about um, the stress that comes from desire or wanting something. Uh, I'm not sure if I've, if if that's correct, but if um, if 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 that is uh, true, then how how does that relate to, i suppose in terms of fitness and people wanting to get fit and healthy and start a workout program you know what 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 is that stress that i, I think i'm right in you where you're referring to and it, and how do you sort of make that um how do you manage that into in, into a sort of a positive way my guess is somebody was looking at notes about the willpower instinct so another book that i wrote about willpower um where i talk about the difference between wanting and uh, and liking or wanting and joy. And uh, particularly when it comes to destructive behaviors and addictions and how that's linked to stress. So one thing we know is that um, the things that people tend to get addicted to, whether it's behaviors or substances, um, that they're very good at tricking your brain into predicting that if you engage with them, you'll feel good, while at the same time producing a really strong feeling of stress until you've given into that craving. So if you actually look at what's happening when someone is experiencing a craving in the brain, it's this really insidious form of, you could call it a form of a stress response in that it's trying to provoke a certain response. So like, let's say that you're somebody who's trying to quit smoking or vaping and you see an image of somebody smoking what will happen in your brain is it will activate, um, first of all, areas of the brain that predict feeling good, uh, it's like the reward system of the brain that will make you believe engaging with it will feel good, but also you'll see activated areas of the brain that create physical pain, uh, discomfort, and anxiety. So your brain as a way of motivating you will create a feeling of distress that wasn't present until you saw this thing that reminded you of of whatever it is that you are addicted to. So now you've got a brain that is in distress and it's sort of it's this fake stress it is inventing to make you give in. You've got your brain telling you that giving in is the only thing that will get rid of the stress and pain that your brain is actually creating to motivate you. And then at the same time, you see activation of areas of the brain that are involved in planning movement and executing um, behavior. So mm -hmm. if you are someone who smokes and you like me, you're left handed, you might actually see activation in the areas of the brain that plan a reaching movement of the left hand as if I were gonna reach for a pack of cigarettes or a lighter. Um, and so all of that is super strongly linked in the brain. Um, and so in the willpower instinct, what I talk about is, you know, there are skills that you can develop that help literally disentangle all of that, those strong connections in your brain so that even if you're feeling the wanting, even if you're feeling the stress, your brain cannot coordinate those feelings to the motor pattern as strongly. You actually start to see it's called functional um, disconnection. So you, rather than that functional connection, things like mindfulness, things like remembering your values or a commitment that you've made to stop smoking. So these things you can do that is, again, it's so how it's similar to stress and the way I think about stress is you've got this instinct that humans are born with which is to produce cravings to compel you to give in. Um, just like you have a fight or flight response that in moments of feeling stress will compel you to fight or flee. Um, but we also know that humans have this natural capacity to get in there and interrupt instincts that aren't serving us and to use some of our other, you can think of them as higher instincts um, or, or even like deep inner strengths that we've cultivated to choose something different and something that allows us to really choose whatever it is that we care about most. And that's a different kind of wanting. You know, I, I sometimes talk about that as want power, as a part of willpower. That want power is the ability to know what matters most to you. And that's a very different thing than the want you might have in the moment to not get out of bed and go for a run, or the want that you might have in this moment to eat something that's gonna make you feel ill and not create health. 
um, there's a different level of wanting that is, this is who I want to be. This is how I want to show up in the world. This is what I want to create in my life. And that's, a, that is also a strength that we can develop. So are they, so it sounds like you've got two different types of wants. One is if you're addicted to alcohol or smoking or whatever drugs that, that there's something in the brain is kind of, um, helping you to create an urgency to meet that need is, is is that correct so you've got this kind yeah. of negative although and it's not just for things we think of as classic addictions i mean the same thing happens if you're somebody who gets an emotional release out of criticizing your spouse it's going to be right. the same thing if you're somebody who likes to buy things to make you feel better you're going to get the same thing when you're online shopping so and social media you know if you're scrolling through and you get a little uh, you feel addicted to the moral outrage that you see on Twitter. I mean, there's a lot of things that go beyond our classic definitions of mm -hmm. of addiction, where you see that same pattern, where your brain keeps saying, like, this will this will be the make you feel good. But if you actually pay attention, it is continuing to create the underlying distress that makes you need to keep going with it. That's the that's the real tell that something mm -hmm. is is what you know it is moving into that territory of addiction and that you can't ever actually experience satisfaction and joy from it like that's right. kind of, that's my definition of addiction that's not really a clinical definition and so mm. if you continue to engage with it, it you will only be destructive so how does that um link into exercise then because i guess for me people have said that exercise is also an addiction you know like i feel i don't feel good if i don't do it if I'm if I go for a longer period of time, I'm definitely not great with other yeah. people. So which which I guess sounds like if you're if you're an alcoholic or whatever. You know, yeah. Well, OK, thing. no, so this is a really important topic. So one thing we need to do is distinguish dependence from harmful addictive uh, addiction. So um, like, you know what else? I get really uh, a worse version of myself if I don't do eat and sleep. <laughs> and we don't talk about that as being like, oh, no, you're addicted to sleep. And like, you can't go more than a day without it. There's something very wrong. <laughs> so one, one, thing I, one thing I want to say is that movement is as critical to our mental and physical health as sleeping and eating. And uh, therefore, people who engage with it on a regular basis will become dependent on it. And the research on this is super clear. If you're somebody who regularly exercises and for some reason, illness, your schedule, something gets in the way of that and you don't exercise for a couple of days, you start to show symptoms of depression and anxiety. Um, you are a worse version of yourself. And as soon as you're able to move again, you sort of are restored to the better and happier version of yourself. Um, now, there is such a thing as exercise addiction, and I don't want to minimize uh, how destructive that can be. But it, it is not the typical experience that people have and, and a true sort of harmful, destructive addiction to exercise is when people, um, they never feel like they've done enough. They start to organize their entire lives around it to the point where it interferes with their job, with their relationships. They do so much of it that they start to injure themselves and yet they refuse to take care of themselves. This it is almost always related to problems with body image and eating disorders and linking exercise to weight, which is something that I strongly discourage. You know, I'm a psychologist. I'm here to tell you that moving your body is good for your mental health, your happiness, your meaning in life, your relationships with others. I don't care how many calories you burn. And so when we talk about the harmful side of addiction, it's almost always linked to, um, to suffering that is related to weight and eating disorders and body dysmorphia and that sort of thing. Um, if you don't, if you do not have a strong link in your mind between exercise and that sort of thing, it's kind of it, it's kind of hard to get hooked on exercise in a really destructive way. Um, the only other time you might see something like a, that that sort of over exercise is among people who have suffered deeply and have found through movement the only thing that provides relief. And sometimes what you'll see is people who um, are recovering from addiction, trauma, depression, and grief, because, because exercise can so profoundly remodel your brain over time. Um, it is the most amazing medicine for many people. Again, not immediately. It's not like if you're depressed and you go for a walk, it's like, wow, you're not depressed anymore. But I'm talking about over time, systematically, regular exercise 
that um, sometimes it becomes such powerful medicine that people can uh, can really can, can turn it into their primary coping strategy as opposed to allowing that transformation to then encourage them to engage in, in other activities and roles that are also meaningful and connecting. Uh, but for the most part, right, so exercise mm -hmm. addiction, mostly what we're talking about is a healthy dependence on something that changes your brain chemistry in ways that make you a better version of yourself, that create a, a feeling about yourself, an, a self-image that allows you to pursue other goals in your life, um, that it is an activity that when people find the right form of movement for them, it is sort of at every level of your being, biological, psychological, social, it fuels you for everything else that matters in your life. And that's, I, I in my book, I talk about it as being kind of like a commitment, a, a relationship that you're committed to, because you, you can't really imagine life without it. And so you choose to commit to it, like a wonderful marriage or the way that you are committed to your children. Um, you want a life that includes it. And that's, I think, what most people experience. So do they know what happens in the brain between those two things, you know, like the, the bad addictions and, and the good addictions? Or are they just, I, I won't, I'll try and find a different word to addiction, but it, it, it did, does different things happen if it's, mm -hmm. if you're getting those type of, endorphin rush from exercise compared to if you you know you go and have a yeah. uh, whatever a drink or a shot of something yeah so there are some of the same chemicals involved um one of the things that's really interesting about the difference between how exercise changes your brain and how other addictions change your brain is that they actually affect the reward system uh similarly sometimes in the short term within that they can give you a buzz or make you feel good so you know, for example, if you look at different forms of movement, they release a lot of the same chemicals as substances that people use recreationally or abuse. So endorphins, endogenous opioids, um, endocannabinoids, which are the brain chemical that cannabis mimics, uh, dopamine, adrenaline. So things that, that can really make people feel good uh, in the short term. So exercise upregulates all of those in the short term. But what's so fascinating is that the things we tend to get addicted to that become destructive uh, in the short term they increase levels of those chemicals but they increase them so much that they teach your brain to prepare for an overload of those chemicals in the future by suppressing them anytime you're not exposed to those substances mm -hmm. so if you're somebody who regularly uses um, what we might call recreational drugs you're actually teaching your brain to give you less access to those chemicals in your everyday life. And that's one of the reasons why um, people who deal with addiction often experience severe depression, lack of motivation and inability to take joy in things that used to provide them pleasure because your brain is literally suppressing your capacity to feel joy and pleasure. Is Exercise- that just to keep it in balance then? Yeah, it is. That's what I sometimes right. talk about it is it's like, so the drugs themselves produce such an overload, it's completely out of balance. And if you imagine a bathtub, if you if you couldn't turn the faucet off or you didn't know when the faucet was gonna turn off, you could pull the plug and pulling the plug would, would drain things. And that's sort of what your brain does. It pulls the plug and is draining your capacity for, for joy and motivation because it expects the faucet to be, you know, getting ready to drown the whole situation. So, so exercise does the opposite. Um, exercise, because it releases these chemicals in lower levels for whatever reason, like I, I wish there's not like a moral reason for this. It's not like because exercise is good and drugs are bad. But for whatever reason, exercise is just it seems to be the only um, re rewarding thing that upregulates all of those chemicals. So it, it makes your brain more sensitive to joy. And literally the only thing else that seems to do this are certain advanced therapies for depression, including deep brain stimulation, where people literally get an electrode implanted in their brain, attached to a generator in their chest wall. That's like a pacemaker that like you would get for your heart, but it's a pacemaker for your brain's reward system. And you can get this sort of steady, low level pulse of energy to your reward system to be like, hey, pff, pff, like give me some dopamine, like let's get some endocannabinoids going on in there. And it can cure even severe long-standing depression. 
And you see changes in the brain that really are about bringing the reward system back to life and sensitizing your capacity for pleasure and motivation. So exercise does the same thing. And again, I, what I it's, think is fascinating is I've looked, because when I was writing about this, I thought, okay, well, I need to compare this to something. I couldn't find anything except deep brain stimulation that has the same effect on the brain. And again, it's not immediate though, like deep brain stimulation, you got the implant in there. Some Sometimes people are like, immediately, I'm not depressed anymore. It's, it's 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 bizarre from a scientific point of view um, and a miracle for the people who experience it. But with exercise, it takes more like six weeks <laughs> to start to see some of these changes, which is why if you have people who are depressed and you tell them to exercise and they go for that walk or run and it's so hard to get started because every system of their body and brain are telling them not to move. And because they are experiencing depression, their brain does not give them that that initial runner's high. And so by the end of it, they're just tired and angry. And maybe they were feeling like shame and self-criticism because they weren't able to like muster up a runner's high. Uh, it can be really tricky to use exercise for mental health um, to get through that period where you are literally, you're, you're creating a new brain that mm. is going to, and then this is, it's not just for depression. I mean, this is sort of whatever your baseline is. And this is the process by which people develop a healthy addiction exercise. So the same thing that makes exercise a powerful treatment for depression and grief and trauma, um, it's the same process by which people who claim to not like exercise become addicted uh, to it. And it again, it, it seems to operate on this time course of six weeks. I, I, six I, weeks kept, I kept seeing that in study after study. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's the kind of thing where people will, you know, maybe they'll like buy a, a bike for at home use, or they'll start going to some classes at the gym. And in the beginning, they'll swear, I hate exercise, I hate this, I hate this. And then something starts to change. Usually in the beginning, what changes first is um, how they feel about themselves. So maybe you're not getting that amazing exercise high, you haven't quite developed the physical skills yet where you can, you know, say like, it's much easier than it was in the beginning. But people's sense of self starts to change first. And they're like, wow, I did that. Like I stayed in that class. I didn't give up. I didn't get off the bike after three minutes when I first, you know, had the thought that this is hard. Um, so their sense of self changes first. And then the body catches up and people develop, you know, skills and muscles are changing and the heart is changing and the nervous system is changing and things get a little bit easier, which makes things a little bit more pleasurable. The body's ability to give you an adrenaline rush also changes. This is something that I've, I've um, only started to see research about since I wrote the book. This isn't even in the book, but I didn't know this, that um, your capacity to release higher levels of adrenaline is part of what it means to become physically fit and mm. so it allows people to do harder things so of course like you know then someone who's running a marathon who's really fit versus someone who hasn't run a marathon they're going to be able to dig deep and pull out that adrenaline reserve to push through but as a psychologist what i'm thinking is i know that after a couple months of hit training i can pull something out in that second half of the workout that was not available to me in the beginning and it feels so psychologically powerful and now i'm thinking like i've like literally given myself a bigger reserve of adrenaline anyways and then your brain changes and then your brain changes in structure and how many dopamine receptors are available and you know uh baseline levels of endocannabinoids and all of these other things that make you more sensitive to joy and more motivated in a way that is, if you were depressed, would be similar to a really effective antidepressant medication. How long does that take to undo? Because I guess we've all been working out, well, a lot of us have worked out for many years and then you have a few weeks off and it's, uh, you have to go, you know, it seems like, it feels like you almost have to go through that process again, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe not quite six weeks, but did, did, have you been able to see you know, to re-engage yourself, what that period seems There to haven't be. been a lot of studies that have done enforced sedentary uh, living for that long. So there, there are a number of studies that take people who regularly exercise and force them to become less active. But apart for ethical reasons, I think I've seen like a, a maximum of two weeks that right. people have been forced to not be active. And what you see in those cases is, right, like the, the mood effects are immediate, in part because of so there's all these longer lasting changes that are happening, but we know that there is a, a particular brain chemistry change that happens when you move your body in any way that gets your heart rate up um, or that really keeps you in continuous movement for at least 20 minutes. So if you're giving up that, 
you're giving up. It's almost like not eating. Like you won't starve to death right away, but you're gonna be, you're gonna really notice that you want to eat. And that's because we you know when you exercise for at least 20 minutes in a like at least a moderate level of intensity, it doesn't need to be more than that, but your heart rate's up a little bit. Um, you see increases in endocannabinoids, dopamine and adrenaline. And if you're using music or you're moving with other people, definitely add endorphins to that. Um, that you're gonna notice if you haven't reset your brain chemistry in that way in a while. And it's one of the reasons why, by the way, I exercise first thing in the morning, um, even though I'm not a morning person. And if, if I were like being judged on my physical skills, speed or strength or anything like that, I would work out late at night if I needed my body to be at its best. But I work out first thing in the morning because I know it resets my brain chemistry so powerfully. I wanna take advantage of that. I want to then for the, you know, for the rest of the day, be that version of myself. Mm. You, you talk in the book about the, the runner's high and the evolution to that. And, and also um, how you, there's, there's different things that kind of kick it off. I, I wondered if you you'd just sort of explain a little bit about what you found in terms of that feeling. I know it's something I've never really been able to explain and again, figure out whether it's really happening or not. But I, I normally find out that about, you know, sort of 20 to 30 minutes in, suddenly my my thought process changes uh, or a lot of the stress of the day gets lifted. And then I kind of go into this creative stage where I'm making notes and coming up with ideas and suddenly everybody's wonderful, even people I've you know been arguing with. <laughs> So is, is that the runner's high or? Uh, yeah, that is that what you just described is the classic <laughs> runner's high, which in the book I call the persistence high because you don't have to run to get it. And I don't run. <laughs> and I can tell you, I can promise everyone listening or watching to this. If you're not a runner, you can get it. So this is when I was saying that research um, suggests that about 20 minutes of continuous movement triggers this this reliable change in brain chemistry. So that's what I'm talking about. It is. It seems to be that your brain rewards you for physical effort because for hundreds of thousands of years, that's what humans had to do to survive. You know, even like at the most basic level, spending hours a day looking for food, which required walking and sometimes running and ca carrying heavy things like physical labor. And the idea here is that your your brain is sort of adapted, developed this way to reward you for doing things that are difficult and meaningful. And when it understands that you're committed to it, say 20 minutes in, it's gonna start releasing brain chemicals that give you energy, that reduce pain, that um, decrease stress and anxiety and increase optimism and hope. It's almost like if you think about if you were out looking for food and you needed to bring food back to your community, um, what, what state of mind and body would you need to be in to keep going, to keep searching? That's the state of mind and body that your brain gives to you when you engage in continuous movement for about 20 minutes. And so it often starts with this. And the first thing that people often notice is suddenly the movement itself feels easier. And again, you maybe feel that at like a 20 minute mark. It's not like it's not like your muscles have a timer or your brain is a timer. So 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. Um, you start to notice everything feels easier. And that's because you've been releasing these brain chemicals that are facilitating movement, that are increasing energy and decreasing pain. So people start to feel like if they're running, they're like they're floating. Or, you know, when I am when I'm doing my HIT workout, suddenly I don't feel so heavy. Like I can just produce more power, whatever it is. Um, then you start to notice that any of that like inner suffering in your mind that was present. So worrying ruminating, feeling hopeless, everything starts, it's like a cloud that's that's starting to clear. And people often report feeling just hopeful. And then there's this extra surge that, and that's often, by the way, when people start to feel creative, they have a new perspective on things. It's, it's that clearing of the mind. And many people will get to the next level, which is the thing that like everyone is often chasing, which is the euphoria. And that's where the, you know, these brain chemicals, they've been released for a while. Maybe you've hit a certain level of intensity that's a little bit higher and people re will report ecstasy. Like they feel amazing, like they could take on the world. And it's, it's a, that's like the real high. 
not everyone gets to that stage every workout don't feel like um like your brain is betraying you if you're not feeling ecstasy but you can start to notice that movement feels easier you feel like you could keep going and there is that kind of optimism and hopefulness um and that a clearing a calming of the the inner struggle and by the way you mentioned feeling like you love everyone and that is also a signature part of um, the exercise high because so in so much of it is driven by endocannabinoids and endorphins and both of those are bonding brain chemicals so endocannabinoids and endorphins increase trust and belonging with others when their levels are higher it is easier to take joy in social connection. So like it, it feels safer and more pleasant to make eye contact. A hug is gonna feel better. Other people's stories are more interesting. It feels more delightful to laugh with others, to cooperate with others. When, when those brain chemicals are high, it's what makes just being a social human being so much more enjoyable. Mm. Which is, by the way, one of the reasons why exercise is so good for social anxiety, because for a lot of people who are dealing with social anxiety, uh, it, it, it requires a little bit of a shift in brain chemistry to get to that place where you really feel safe and open to connection. Um, and so one of the runners that I interviewed, what it, she, she talked about how she was like, it doesn't matter where she goes after she finishes running, like the, the person at the, at the checkout counter is like, I love him and I love everyone. I just thought it was such a funny, but I, I understand. I feel that way too. I'm somebody who's pretty introverted. And before I teach an exercise class, I notice like I'm so internal and reserved. Mm -hmm. And after the exercise class, I want to hang out. I want to stay and chat every I'm like in love with all of my students in a platonic and appropriate way. You know, like I want to hear about their lives. It's just it's it's still me, but it's it's a different version of me and it's mm. one that I value. And so it's, it's one of the reasons, again, why I said that movement is so important to me is it gives us access to these human joys. And um, I think many people find that movement brings out a side of themselves that they really value but that they also struggle with. And sometimes it's it's a quality like courage. Sometimes it's a competitive spirit. Sometimes it's a quality of gracefulness or, or beauty. Sometimes it's mental focus and flow. And that's a, that's a great way to pick a workout, by the way, mm. is when it, it brings out something in you that you value, but that you also have struggled with. It's one of the reasons why I love boxing. That brings <laughs> out my, my fighting self, which is... <laughs> But well, it seems to bring out who the, the best bits of you, doesn't it? You know, it, it's certainly for me, like there's when, when you're doing it, when I, like, I, I don't, I'm a big class person, but when I do do stuff together and, or even on my own, you know, you, you can kind of virtually connect. It just seems to bring out what we're here for. And you, you know, you feel good. You seem to be good for others. There doesn't seem to be any kind of negative to it, I suppose, you know, you can't, I can't, not, not that I can see it, but so what's the, what's the hope chemical then that, that's, <laughs> that's released? There was, yeah. a, was there a study or something on, on that? Oh, so many studies. What I love, okay, so this science is so new that um, like the New York Times and, and other, you know, people who cover science, they keep publishing these breathless articles like the last year or two, like we've never known. It's absolutely amazing. This new study shows like we're still in this stage of the research, which I, I'm like so happy to be able to share this research with people. It is of all the stuff that I write about. It's the thing where people literally did not know. And once you know, you can't unknow. So <laughs> I'm trying to like prep people for this. So here is what you will now never be able to forget. Um, until this current decade, scientists did not know that your muscles are endocrine organs. So endocrine organs are organs in your body that synthesize and release chemicals into your bloodstream that affect every system of your body. And, you know, biologists basically thought muscles were there to use energy to move your bones around in place. Um, but your muscles are actually like a pharmacy in the same way that like your adrenal glands or your pituitary gland, um, your pancreas, your muscles are this amazing pharmacy that are manufacturing and storing chemicals that have profound effects on your physical and your mental health. And let me just like, give some examples. So first of all, they're called myokines. So myo means muscle and kind means set into motion by. 
So these chemicals called myokines, they're set into motion by your muscles into your bloodstream where they can travel and affect your heart, your immune system, your brain. Um, so some of them do uh, really important things like help you regulate blood sugar to improve your metabolism and help you use energy. Some of them kill cancer cells when they're in your bloodstream and help your immune system kill cancer cells. Um, some of them are really important for cardiovascular health and help protect the health of, say, your blood vessels in your heart. So, so researchers now think that these, these chemicals that your muscles produce, these molecules, are one of the reasons why all forms of exercise are linked to better physical health and reduced risk of like every disease you can imagine. It's all forms of exercise because all forms of exercise engage muscles and your muscles are this pharmacy. But so here's, so the hope molecule thing. So some of these myokines have their strongest effects on your brain. And so, and they are only released when you contract your muscles. So that's one thing I, I forgot to mention. Your muscles are not giving up these myokines unless you use them. It's like, like your muscles, you know, it's like a rule. You use them and your muscles say, okay, I guess you are engaged with life. Let me help you out <laughs> by giving you all these chemicals that will protect your heart and kill cancer cells and regulate your blood sugar, right? So you have to, you have to move your body wow. um, basically in order to get the, the full effect of this pharmacy you have. So when you exercise, your muscles release some chemicals that particularly target your brain. And when they reach your brain in the short term, some of these chemicals uh, immediately act like an anti-anxiety. So to start to suppress fear and stress and worry and increase motivation and, and actually enhance learning as well. So a short term effect. And in the long term, when your brain is regularly exposed to these chemicals, your brain starts to change in, in structure and function in ways that make you more resilient to stress. So it literally starts to change the connections between the systems of your brain that help you control your emotions, that help you um, have a challenge response rather than a fight or flight response to stress, that, that help you recover from things like depression or grief. And um, a study that was published, I think it was maybe 2014, 2015, one of the first studies to look at this, the researchers called them hope molecules because the studies were showing that exercise was um, preventing trauma-induced depression, that there were literally molecules being released from your muscles that were like, like an intravenous dose of hope in really difficult circumstances. So this is the thing I hope that people now, once you know it, you, you will never unknow, is that when you exercise, when you use your muscles, you are giving yourself medicine. And it is medicine you can't access any other way. You can't take a pill that has hope molecules in it. Not yet, anyways. You need to lift something heavy or push something or dance or walk or play sports or garden. As long as you're using your body, your muscles are gonna be releasing these chemicals. And again, there are dozens of them that, and I just happen to love the hope molecules because I do like to think that I'm giving myself an intravenous dose of hope when I exercise. Mm. Is, have you found that there's any types of movement that's better or worse or any sort of, you know, in terms of the dosage or intensities that, that kind of <clears throat> are in that sweet spot of, you know, releasing lots of hope molecules? Yeah. So, um, and again, this is, so some people think this is bad news, but I just like to keep it real and tell you what the data says. Uh, more is better. Higher intensity, higher duration is probably going to be more effective. And I think like, so you have to come to terms with what that means for your life. So if somebody is mm -hmm. listening to this and they don't exercise at all, and they think that they hate all forms of movement, and it is going to be a big deal to figure out how to move for three minutes tomorrow, to figure out something that works with the body that you have and feels possible and maybe even enjoyable. Like if that's you, I don't want you thinking, okay, to get my maximum dose of hope molecules, I need to eventually be able to work at a vigorous intensity 
for longer than 20 minutes. If that's if you're not there, you don't need to worry about it yet because there's so much other benefit to moving in any way, any dose, any intensity. And by the way, if you add music, I guarantee the that's like that is perfect medicine for people who are just starting out. One song, 3 minutes, move your body in whatever way is not not moving. Like it could li literally study showing like hand gestures hand gesture, like you're conducting the song, it will literally give you, start to give you some of these benefits we've talked about. Anyways, but to put that aside, if you're somebody who's like, I'm gonna really harness this effect, um, going longer, going further, pushing harder, it, it's whatever is the most intense thing you can sustain and enjoy uh, is probably gonna have the, the biggest effect. And that's not true for everything in life. Um, but it, it is also, again, one of the reasons why I encourage people to focus on the meaning of movement, because meaning allows us to tolerate discomfort and challenge in a way that we wouldn't tolerate it if it's meaningless. So if you're somebody who, you know, you have been, let's say you hate running and you hate treadmills and your primary workout is running on a treadmill, uh, you are not going to be able to work as hard as you could and get benefit as much as if you found a form of movement where when you do it, you feel just so badass, you feel so incredible, and you've got the soundtrack that is making you feel amazing, or you're doing it with the, the coach who pushes you and makes you feel like an athlete, or you're you know, in a gym with a community of people who inspire you. Like People need to find a form of movement that feels when they're doing it, they're kind of amazed by who they are when they're doing it. That's how I feel uh, about when doing HIT, the, the particular HIT workout I do. The whole time I'm doing it, I'm kind of like, I can't believe I'm still doing this uh, <laughs> in a really good way, not like, and I have a better, th better things to do. So meaning will allow people to approach the intensity that will maximize some of these um, benefits that we're talking about. Mm. So it's really just doing it as much as what you're capable of doing. Yeah, and that, and that fits in your life. I mean, right. I am not saying that doing 10 hours of high intensity exercise, I, I'm sure there is, I don't know yet what the dose is at which people fall off into, this is not helpful anymore because people aren't studying it. I mean, it, it's hard enough to get most people to do an hour of intense work, but you know, so studies that show if you can get people to run to exhaustion where they really, they just, they can't run anymore. They have given their all that produces really high levels of myokines more than if you go for a gentle stroll. So like sort of that's the level of research that we have. We do not have research saying you should exercise for 10 hours a day. Yeah. I guess just it's just in one case of people things. were wondering. Yeah. I guess it's one of those things that you you know, you just now knowing some of this research, you kind of have to start playing around with yourself because my guess is we're all a little bit different. Um, but I, I guess the the main thing is to try and sort of yeah, do do as much as you can. Push yourself and and try and see, you know, what how, how you feel afterwards. I guess. Um, yeah, and I think that's it, true for no matter what it is that you're trying to experience from movement. You pay mm -hmm. attention to your direct experience, and you you start to think about movement as a vehicle for experiencing joy in life, as opposed to something you have to get through in order to you know burn calories or prevent a heart attack. Um, the experience itself can be pleasurable or meaningful. And if you get either one of those, uh, you know, that's really, that's the sweet spot. And sometimes mm. you get both. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I think it's, it's also uh, uh, one of the things about the traditional fitness is it's very much about losing weight, getting into shape, getting a six pack. And I, I always say, well, although that's great and that's probably a side effect, you know, you know I, th I think it's not ever enough to kind of keep you doing it. And I, I certainly know myself as I've got older, the the mental benefits, particularly as we're going through this period, and I'm you know, sort of interested to get your thoughts, but you know, it's a, it's a tough period for most people. We are locked in, we're actually encouraged not to be going out, not to be moving not to be social, which I know, you know, you, you call something called collective joy. Mm. Um, so it's almost seems everything against what, um, <laughs> what, what makes you feel good is we, we you know, we're, we're being put into that situation to prevent that. What, what, what's your thoughts with what's going on as it, as it relates to what's good for people and, and yeah. how we're having to deal with things today? Yeah. So, you know, in one of the things that's interesting about 
the COVID-19 pandemic is it's so global that research is emerging from so many different countries, both about the mental health impacts of the crisis and the economic uncertainty and the chaos and the loss and the grief and all of that. Um, people are really struggling around the world. So we, we can say this is an event that is traumatic for people and mm -hmm. is creating you know, mental health crises around the world. And we also now have this emerging research that has popped up again from like almost every continent I think I've seen, uh, many countries, that physical activity throughout this pandemic is strongly linked to mental health and to the degree that people have been able to sustain or increase physical activity levels, they have been less susceptible to developing depression, anxiety, loneliness. Um, and it's, again, you see this globally and universally. So I think that um, it's a really important time for people to think about movement and physical activity as absolutely essential to the degree that you can find a way to make it part of your life. It's not self-indulgent. And I understand that a lot of people around the world are dealing with less time, fewer resources, um, whether they're schooling their kids or caregiving for sick loved ones or you know trying to find work. I mean, I understand now the challenge of movement. It's not just what you said, where you can't go to class in a lot of places. It's that also, you know, you can't go out and register for a race and run with 5,000 people swarmed around you and get that collective joy. There's a lot of opportunities that people are missing, but it's not only that, it's also, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And so mm. it can feel either less, less urgent or less possible to move. And I just can't emphasize enough in the same, to the same degree that you are not, you haven't stopped eating and you hopefully you haven't stopped sleeping. Um, you need to think of movement as essential to getting through this period. And so um, I have been encouraging people to look for ways to move with people that they're in relationship with, in community with, or living with. So, you know, some of the people that I, some of my students, for example, live alone and they really haven't seen a lot of other people in a long time um, because they're at risk and are staying at home. So, but if you live with other people, if you're in community with other people, we know that when you move with them, it strengthens that relationship. So look for ways to choose physical activity. And people are doing such amazing examples of that. What was I was reading about a new trend of snow yoga. Now it's getting really cold and people are getting all bundled up. And like, it's exciting to do yoga in the snow. Um, people are having dance parties in their living room and making TikTok videos and learning all sorts of, you know, physical skills and pretending they're an American Ninja Warrior. And there's all sorts of stuff you can do at home um, with your friends or your family. And the other thing that I've been encouraging people to do is if you have the capacity, now is the time to invest in a relationship with an activity that really brings out a side of you that is important. So when COVID struck and we had a shelter in place and everything in my life was canceled, uh, I got a heavy boxing bag, put it in the driveway and started boxing almost every day. And I really didn't have time for that when I was teaching uh, six to eight dance classes a week. I just, it was too focused on other ways of being in my body. It wasn't really compatible, but now suddenly I could dedicate myself to training in this way that made me feel strong and fierce and powerful. And that activity helped me get through the first few months of the pandemic when things were at their most chaotic and I had the least access to, to things that would typically bring me meaning and joy. And I think that if you have the time in the room to do that, to think about, is there a form of movement that you can imagine making you feel that way about yourself? or making you feel the way you want to feel about yourself to to find whether it's online training or or real life training or you know however you want to go about it um, for many people during covid it's been it's been moving outdoors even in cold weather um, the the sense of being connected to nature as like a really powerfully healing experience something mm. that gives perspective yeah i i i, I let people read the collective joy chapter in the book because i think it's pretty interesting but how with, with without being able to do that in quite the same way as what we did probably when you wrote the book is it, have you found ways of being able to get that collective joy virtually so you know mm -hmm. if you look at things like peloton or that some of these apps that are around can, can that be achieved without yeah. being in person yeah i will say i'm not a fan of the zoom classes 
Um, <laughs> when I teach movement in Zoom, I've had to come up with some very specific strategies because so collective joy relies on synchrony. And anyone who in the fitness world knows synchrony is a problem with, with Zoom, with a lot of different formats. Um, so I've had to find ways to to really amplify the feeling of synchrony when I'm trying to teach dance online. And I have some strategies for that. But actually, I, I am a big fan of uh, these sort of high production value programs like Peloton. By the, I'm not affiliated with any of these companies. Um, Peloton, Less Mills on Demand is the system that I use all the time. And again, they're, they're not sponsoring me. I just love them so much um, that I recommend them if people are looking for you know, a, a program. Um, but there's so many of these great streaming platforms where the quality and the production is so strong that you really feel yourself a part of a, a movement community. And there are studies showing that when you move in sync with an avatar, it doesn't even have to be a human being, it could literally be like an avatar, like a, like a video game kind of avatar, you still get an endorphin rush, you still feel a sense of being connected to something bigger than yourself. So I know it is possible. And I, I'm so I'm a big fan of whether it is something live like Zoom with an actual human interaction, or it's something that's much more mediated, like an on demand class through a, a streaming service that can give you a kind of collective joy. But man, am I happy to be teaching in person? We're out there. It was it was in the 30s this morning, which is really cold for California. I know there are people in Minnesota being like, please, we'd be in shorts <laughs> if it were that warm right now. But in the 30s, and you know, my women are showing up in their gloves. Somebody actually had a parka on this morning that didn't come off until song four. But we are dancing outdoors, and it is so good after having gone six months of yeah. not moving in community. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly makes you appreciate that. I know I've been able to, our local gym has been able to sort of class itself as a medical center. And just, although I didn't think I really, I, when I used to go in the gym, I put my earphones on and I wouldn't really talk to a lot of people. I'd have my music and that, but I did actually, what I realized is I did kind of interact, even if it was quite loosely, you know, you had other people in there and they'd spot you and stuff. And although I've got a pretty decent gym at home, you know, you miss that just that connection i think that's um that's so important and you know you come out feeling on top of the world when when you when you when you leave the gym and i suppose you yeah you you don't realize how you know how much it it does for people really you know, take take it for granted that's for sure and the thing that i want to say about that too for people who are thinking about finding a movement community is also when you choose a form of movement that brings out something you value in yourself that that extra little bit of collective joy is that other people see it in you too. And if they're there, they value it also. And that's mm. not something that everyone gets to experience in life. Like, you know, take the example of boxing. There may not be a lot of people in my life who see me as a fighter. In fact, uh, when I mentioned this in an interview, I actually got an email from my father who was like, ha ha ha, you're not <laughs> fierce. Like literally that's what he emailed me. I was like, okay, so not everyone in my life sees me as a fighter. But if I were to go to a boxing gym, where everyone is there and people are celebrating, you know, when I when I improve my hook that and there's all that energy in the room. That's part of what the collective joy is, is it's that you find these communities that reflect back to you what it is that you're developing in yourself and value it. And so, again, again, it's why it's so important to find movement that inspires you, not just the movement that you've been told will transform what your body looks like the fastest. Mm. So, well, look, I've just got a couple of questions before we wrap up, but I've got one random one that I wanted to ask because um, I think it's relevant. And it's about lactic acid. Um, oh, and, yes. And, and how that, um, like, we all hate the feeling of it. Um, but I know if I have a good workout, I, I, I feel as I've done something if I get that lactic acid built in. But I've always read it's not good for you. But I think you've got to, there's, there's some interesting information about that as well, isn't there? Yes. So lactic acid or lactate um, as a metabolic byproduct of, of muscle contraction of, of, you know, your muscles using energy, uh, it's an anti-anxiety, which is like amazing. It is, um, it is, it travels to the brain like myokines and its primary effect on the brain seems to be to reduce anxiety and promote psychological resilience. So, you know, and by the way, there's like, uh, so there's some controversy, but a lot of people think that that lactate or lactic acid is not is not necessarily causing the muscle burn and that sort of thing. I, like, it's not entirely clear what physical symptoms 
uh, are actually associated with lactate or lactic acid, but we know that your muscles produce it when you exercise. And so I tell people like, even if you know there's some controversy around it, don't worry about that. When you feel your muscles getting fatigued or you feel that, you know, that burn that we usually, we associate with lactic acid, you need to tell yourself in that moment, that like that is the evidence that you've just <laughs> given your brain a dose of resilience. Start to associate that sensation with the idea that you are strengthening your mind and your spirit. And I, I feel like that's, and I also will tell myself that when I feel my heart, like at the end of a, a big push of high intensity and my heart is in that, that state where it, it hasn't, it hasn't calmed down yet. And like my, my rib cage is heaving, trying to get that oxygen debt. Um, I will say to myself, like my heart is being strengthened in it, both a physical way, but also like the idea that this is, this is strengthening my courage, my ability to persist. And I like linking the sensation of it to understanding what it's doing for my mind. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to, when, when you're in your workout, um, to, to find those sensations that we usually think of as being unpleasant or even sometimes as signs of weakness. And instead to, to let, to really remind yourself that what I'm feeling right now is strengthening me. And it is a, a sign of how, you know, that I've chosen to move and in doing so, I am, so I'm supporting my, my well-being, mm. my courage, my, my joy. What, what do you think is the evolutionary reason for that then? Is it just, yeah. is it, or do they not know it's, that? You know, oh. a lot of this, the sort of the side effects stuff, I, you know, people don't have good ideas. I mean, like, so oxytocin, for example, is a, a hormone that is released when people run long distances. And it seems to be released to help you regulate fluids, which is important when you run long distances. But hey, as a side effect, oxytocin uh, increases your ability to empathize and connect with others. And it gives you that like warm glow. So it's part of why after marathons, everyone's like wants to hug and like, oh, I love everyone. I don't think that like there's, I don't think there's a particular reason. It's just that so many of these hormones have other effects and uh and they're used for different purposes so if you release oxytocin in order to help regulate your fluid you will get the side effect of oxytocin oxytocin is sometimes released specifically to help you bond and connect with others um but if you release it for another reason you get that side effect so i think it's going to be the same with a lot of these things which is why if movement hijacks these systems you got to take advantage of it yeah yeah just take 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 the benefits from it so so if you couple of quick questions and before we wrap up, um, where can people find out more about you, um, your, your books, your workshops, that kind of thing? Where, do we, where, do we, where should we send people? Uh, yeah, kellymcgonigal.com. Mm -hmm. um, or if it's easy to remember the joy of movement, you will find me that way. Okay. And we'll put the links to the book. I certainly recommend people checking that out. I've got the audio one. It's a um, pretty interesting read or, or, or listen to that, that that's for sure. Um, What's your favorite workout that you like to deliver yourself? You're, you're a teacher, I guess. Is that something you do when you can fit it in writing books and lecturing and stuff? You mean teaching? Oh, yeah. It's a, the, yeah, yeah teaching yeah, movement a, is the most important thing in my life. F seriously. If you, I have said this forever, and I hold, I hold to it. If I had to quit everything I do professionally except for one thing, I would choose to continue to teach movement classes. I mean... There's not even a question. Uh, yeah, so so I mostly teach dance. I've taught a lot of different formats, but I mostly teach dance. And in part, it's because it is it is where I am most effective at bringing out joy in others. Like I might myself, when I'm working out on my own, I love doing all sorts of things, but there's something about how music enters my body and manifests as expressive movement that I know is contagious, the feedback that I get. So I am most effective at eliciting joy in others when I teach dance. And so for that reason, I choose to primarily teach dance. And uh, yeah. Great. What's what's going to be the next topic that you write about and why? Hmm. Well, you know, I've been I have been threatening my publisher to write a book about something that nobody is going to buy a book about. So it may not happen. <laughs> but so I'll tell you what I spent a lot of time thinking about. And I wrote a little bit about it in um, in the joy of movement. And it is um, sometimes referred to as contagious joy or empathic joy or appreciative joy. And this is the human capacity to take joy 
in others to be made glad when you witness other people's virtues and and strengths like that that feeling you get when you see someone overcome a challenge and like you're moved to tears or your heart swells when you see two people be reunited you know you imagine like the videos that people send around on social media and you're like oh that's so touching or so inspiring um the ability to to be proud of of other people's success rather than envious it is such it is such an uplifting joy and the reason i'm so interested in it is um when researchers have asked people the emotions the frequency with which people feel different emotions um at least i found one study that found that this appreciative joy was the least frequently mentioned emotion and uh, as somebody who who takes so much who finds so much courage and hope in that type of appreciative joy, I am I am dismayed by the idea that there are people walking around who don't have access to that. Like, if you can take joy in everyone's joy, that's a lot. That's a lot of joy available. If you can be uplifted by everybody's strength, then there's so much inspiration available to you. So, but you know, this is a hard, you maybe uh, if there's enough people who watch us who would buy a book about that, you can all email me and let me know and I'll show my <laughs> publisher. I think it's not a very sexy topic, but you know, no, I'm interested difficult... in the things that make a difference in people's lives. I think that that could. Yeah, I think I think it's how you package it, but it, it was it was kind of leading me to, to think along the lines to how you started. And I, I suppose you know, it comes about you know, us being happy. And I guess in, in, in the world, it seems as though a lot of us are not very happy. It seems as though we don't always appreciate what we have, even though we've got a lot, we always find things to complain about. I guess that's maybe in the human nature. But one of the things that you've said, and I'll be interested to get your thoughts, is that certain things we seem to train ourselves unconsciously. So we're training ourselves to look for the bad and to create these sort of, you know, bad emotions. But on the on the flip side, if you if you get these chemicals going and you retrain your brain and rewire your brain, you can also start to, to get some of the positive stuff. So is that, is, is the brain like a muscle? Whereas, you know, depending on what you train it to do consciously, you, you can actually make it better. You can become happier and life can be a lot better, but you've got to actually sort of work on it as opposed to it just happening when you wake up in the morning. Yeah, I think for most of us, so it is absolutely true that your your brain is like a muscle and whatever you do, you get better at. And I mean, that's true, whether it's a foreign language or math or or dancing, right? I mean, whatever you do, your, your brain is an organ that is designed to learn from experience. And so it will change itself based on experience. And everything you expose yourself to is an experience. So it's not only just the things you consciously practice but like you said it's it's the media that you listen to it's what you put your attention to your brain treats attention like an experience it's supposed to be changed by so what you read what you listen to um what you smell i mean everything that we experience so you know with that said i am i'm a i'm a really pragmatic person when it comes to what i promise is possible <laughs> So the idea that like you could train your brain and then you'll be happier. Uh, yeah, there are some aspects of happiness that you can cultivate. They tend to be, it's not the, I think when people sometimes say they want to be happy, what they mean is they want to be free from suffering. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, it's pretty hard to train your brain to never worry, to never experience, you know, shame or self-criticism. Um, what, what tends to be easier to strengthen is to be able to experience gratitude when someone helps you rather than resentment. Like it's, 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 the, it's the aspects of happiness that I think of as being like stances that you choose to take toward life, like appreciative joy. Um, and those are the things that when you train in them, you really have a different experience of life. So if that's what you mean by happier, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the things that science is pretty clear about, and it's been true in my experience working with people, is that it's really hard to train yourself to never have an experience you don't want. So if you're someone <laughs> with chronic pain, it's like you can't practice not having pain, but you can practice bringing to pain things like acceptance and mindfulness 
in a way that then allows you to go out and do more activities and then bring an experience of joy and connection to pain that maybe you're never able to fully get rid of. And I think like that's that's this that's a sort of a, a good way to think about what the brain is good at. It's good mm-hmm. at turning its attention towards and adding things. It's not good at suppressing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, it, and from certainly in your research, it seems as though a lot of the things that you would start off with having some kind of pain associated to it, whether, whether it's everything from the lactic acid when you've worked out or or being able to get yourself to a level where suddenly your body's chemicals take over and make you feel better. It's I, I, I suppose it's recognizing the direction you need to go and then allowing the body to sort of assist you in, in some ways, isn't it? Yeah, and I would say that actually exercise is one of the few things you can do that kind of resets the baseline of your brain. So um, like you can't practice happiness in any way that is going to be as effective at increasing your happiness as exercising more. I believe that's what the reason. So you can't like sit down and say, I'm practicing being happy. I'm practicing being happy. You'll actually be happier if you exercise because exercise changes your brain and you'll have more, you know, dopamine receptors available. Um, so (laughs) sometimes you gotta, you gotta go with the mind body relationship and use your body to, uh, to create the mind. Yeah, absolutely. So final question, Uh, escape your limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a memorable example of escaping your own personal limits? Overcoming my fear of flying. I, (laughs) oh yeah, I had. I have an innate fear of flying as in I can't remember ever not being afraid to fly. I didn't fly for the first time until I was, I think, 20. And my first flight was absolutely catastrophic. Afterwards, the flight attendants were like, that was the worst flight they'd ever been on in 30 years of. Anyway, so I had a very traumatic first um, flight that then like embedded in my nervous system a severe fear of flying. And um, for many years, I didn't fly. And uh, I, I had a very narrow life as a result of that in terms of family I could see and travel that I could do. And um, after a certain point, I decided that my life was too constrained and I was going to have to find a way to deal with it because I was no longer willing to choose the charade of comfort as if I was protecting myself from an experience I didn't want that was creating more discomfort because I couldn't have the life that I wanted to have. And so I, I did a lot of things to overcome my fear of flying. I still don't like it, um, but I don't have to like be unconscious to, to do it. And uh, you know, I've been on the longest flight, I think 14 hours. Um, so, and like before COVID I was flying at least several times a month. And the thing, there are two things that allowed me to do that. One was a a deep sense that not flying was in contradiction to my values and my teaching. So I was a psychologist, I was teaching, I was helping people. And there was this one thing in my life where I was really not practicing what I was preaching. I was, I was like trying to just avoid the discomfort and the fear and, and not do something that mattered to me. And so I knew I had to fix it because how am I going to help people? if this huge part of my life is inconsistent with what I'm teaching. And so that was deeply motivating. And it's part of what keeps me flying, even though I still don't like it, which is that like literally the last time I was on a flight that was going through really bad turbulence, um, I got an email during the flight from somebody who had flown for the first time in years to be able to see their dying mother because they'd read in my book where I talked about overcoming my fear of flying and they talked about it with their therapist and blah, blah, blah. And so literally while I'm sitting on this plane thinking like, I don't want to be here, I get an email thanking me for writing about my fear of flying. And now this person was able to be with their mother because of that. That keeps me flying. But the other thing I did is um, I practiced flying by taking indoor cycling classes. I hated indoor cycling. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I, I felt exactly like I feel on a plane that's in the middle of of super turbulence. And I couldn't practice it on a plane because I was too terrified. So I practiced being in an indoor cycling class, hating every minute of it uh, and staying on the bike and telling myself, this is like being on a plane and you can do this and you can get through this. And I ended up becoming certified as a cycling instructor because the experience was so meaningful that even though I thought I hated it, I fell in love with cycling 
because of the <laughs> meaning that it held, which is brings us back fantastic. to that idea. Yeah, fantastic. Great story. Well, Kelly, thanks for sharing all of your knowledge and years of research. It's, you know, I'm, I'm, it's certainly helping me and I, I really hope it helps many others. Uh, recommend that uh, you check out the book, Joy of Movement. You can get it pretty much everywhere. And uh, yeah, I hope, hope to speak to you again um, when you work on, on that, uh, when you work on that next book, maybe. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.